Hi friends, it's Pastor Tony. Glad to be back for another installment in our study of Proverbs. Proverbs and Song of Songs is the focus for the quarter and we're nearing the end so we only have a couple of more chapters of Proverbs to go as far as the study is concerned and then we'll have two chapters in Song of Songs uh, after that. That'll take us through the end of August. And then when we start the new quarter in September, we'll be launching out into the book of Isaiah. That's a daunting task. Uh, but right now before us is chapter 23 of the book of Proverbs. And we're focusing in particular on verses uh, 20 and 21 and 29 through 35. But we will think, think of the broader context of this as well. This comes in the context of some aspirations and desires that are expressed from a parental perspective. We can look at a couple of places. We can look at uh, chapter 23, uh, 15 and 16, where we hear the father speaking to his son. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. And then verses 22 through 25, Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Think about, for a moment, when, if you are a parent, when your children were starting to show those major leaps in development, whether it was those first words, whether it was that first crawl or those first steps that were being taken. I still remember my oldest son, Cohen, when he started to crawl, uh, my wife Ruthann was playing uh, for a service on Saturday evenings and uh, Cohen and I were out in the hallway area because he just wasn't old enough to really be settled. He wasn't young enough to be settled either. So, so we were out in the hallway and in, in a nursery area and I still remember that moment when we were in that hallway and he was on his hands and knees and he started to make that traction and that crawling motion and how exciting it was. You might be able to think back to that too, right? There, there's, a, there's a certain excitement, there's a certain rejoicing when we see something like that. There's a happiness in knowing that our children are doing well and that they're making progress, uh, making progress and, and, and moving towards a greater degree of independence and discovery. You can think about that joy, and, and, and here there's a similar joy that's expressed from parent to child in saying, my desire for you is your well-being. I want to see you grow. I want to see you develop in progress, particularly uh, here in the things that matter most, in that growth in wisdom, right? Make my heart glad. By walking in wisdom. And that making of the heart glad is rooted in a, a desire to, to rejoice in my child's flourishing in wisdom. But not because it shows how great of a parent I am. And we, we can think of that sometimes. Sometimes our hopes and our aspirations for our kids are all bound up in uh, it's showing us to be great parents. Right? But that is not the motivation that we find here. It's, what a great, it's not about what a great job I did as a dad or as, as a mom, Ruthann, my wife. Uh, but I, 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 I am, I'm glad when I see my children progressing in wisdom because it demonstrates that they're walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the joy. Right? 
much like the joy that, that Jesus expressed when the widow gave her might at the temple. You, you might remember that, that there were all these others coming in, the Pharisees and, and others who, who were, lay, were, were dropping their coins in the coffer. And then comes this widow and Jesus gets so stoked by two mites. Two little pennies that she just drops, that she drops in the collection receptacle. And that's, that's what makes Jesus so excited because the others gave out of what they had, but, but she gave out of her poverty and she gave everything that she had. She was walking wholeheartedly before the Lord and it was expressed in her desire to give. Or, or think of that, that joy that, that Paul expresses to the congregations that, that he helped to found and that he helped to shepherd even from a distance uh, when, when they were walking worthily of the gospel. It wasn't Paul patting himself on the back thinking, what a great job I did. Look at, look at this. My, my children, they're doing so well because of me. Well, of course, there was an element of Paul's investment. But Paul's rejoicing was that they were growing in the fear of the Lord that he was their joy, that he was their priority. That's what made him excited and happy. It was that the God that he rejoices in, they were also rejoicing in. The God that he was seeking to pursue, they were also seeking to pursue. There's a parental pride to be sure, but ultimately it's a thankfulness to God, not a pat on my paternal back for a job well done. Now, there are threats that are expressed here in Proverbs 23 to this kind of flourishing and wisdom, uh, to this kind of security uh, of a hope and a future. Um, we find it in different places, uh, being envious of sinners. So um, if I can just go back uh, to verses 19 and 20, and I'm sorry, verses 17 and 18 and following, this leads us into our passages that, that are focal in, in the actual Sunday school literature. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. So you can see the contrast there. Walking in the fear of the Lord means that there is a hope and that there is a future. But being envious of sinners means that there is no future, that there is no hope. You're going to forsake that future. You're going to forsake that hope for temporal things that don't last and that will eventually destroy you. Right? You won't be flourishing in the way of wisdom. So this is one of the threats that, that we see uh, here in, in Proverbs 23 to, to this kind of flourishing. The, the being envious of sinners is diametrically opposed to the fear of the Lord. Recording the company of drunkards and gluttons Listen to, uh, so listen to verse uh, 20 and 21 that comes right after that. Uh, Hear my son, be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. Slumber will clothe them with rags. There's no hope. There's no future there. Um, courting the company of gluttons and, and drunkards will likely mean that you yourself become a glutton and a drunkard, and there's nothing there. There's, 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 it's, it's a dead-end street. They will come to poverty, uh, and slumber will clothe them with rags. And, and that's just a temporal outlook. Think about the eternal ruin that will come with that. So there's another um, threat as well to this kind of flourishing that, that's mentioned, and it. it's prostitutes, uh, the adulteress. My son... Um, Give me your heart, this is verse 26, and let your eyes observe my ways, for a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. Nothing good there. And then uh, 29 and 35, and this is another section that, that's featured in our lesson. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. 
In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. So you have that list of things that will compromise your hope and compromise your future. The, the being among the drunkards and the gluttons, the giving yourself to an adulterous woman. Um, what was the other? La the, uh, the lingering over wine. Right? So all of those things, they are indicative of a lack of self-control and unfettered feeding of appetites that will eventually destroy you. The focus in particular for this lesson will be verses 20 and 21 and verses 29 through 35, that emphasis upon gluttony and, and drunkenness. Um, so as, uh, as, as we prepare to do that, let's just have a word of prayer as we focus on those two things and ask for God's help. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this practical instruction from the book of Proverbs, practical for this life and for the next. And uh, Lord, as it prepares us for eternity, uh, Lord, just help us as we, as we open your word to be wise and to hear your voice as you speak to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So... The big idea that we'll be thinking about is this. As a child of God, whose hope and future are secure in Jesus Christ, pursue the wisdom of sobriety to make your calling and your election sure. This is Proverbs, but I'm borrowing a lot of New Testament language there, aren't I? As a child of God, as a member of God's covenant people, as one who resides in the household of faith, whose hope and future are secure in Christ Jesus. Jesus took our sin away from us, right? He took that debt away. He took our enmity with God away, and he brought us to the Father, to, to, and, and he gave us peace where once we were at war with God. Uh, we have forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. We have an inheritance that is sure and secure in him. Because he ultimately is our inheritance and he ultimately is our security. And because of that, we pursue the wisdom of sobriety. And in that, we make our calling and our election sure. So borrowing from Second Peter, right, where it, there is that short-sightedness, uh, this persistence in things that are not godly, that cause us to, to forget our former purification from our sins, and really, if we walk in that long enough, we'll indicate that we never belong to the Lord in the first place. And so that, that, that's what I want us to be thinking about here, is as a child of God whose hope and future are secure in Jesus Christ, let's pursue the wisdom of sobriety, making our calling and our election sure. A few things that I want to say then about this. I already read it, but, but you have verse 20 and 21, be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. Um, that's not going to be the company that uh, will help you in your pursuit of wisdom. That's not going to be the company that uh, will direct your heart in the way that you should go. And ultimately, you're going to find yourself participating in the things that they participate in. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty Slumber will clothe them with rags. So, a few things, observations that I want to make here. Um, and may, maybe I should just go ahead and, and read 29 through 35 again too. Who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaining. It carries on. Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine. It looks good, you linger over it. And it's smooth going down, but then it bites like an adder, right? And leaves you senseless and saying things that don't 
make any good sense at all, and you become obsessed. Where's my next drink? That's what the last part mentions. Now, I, I want to, these are, these are strong statements. I want, uh, so a few observations. One, uh, this isn't a polemic against food and drink itself, right? So the first thing that I want to say is that food and drink, biblically speaking, are good gifts from God. So this isn't a polemic against them. Uh, remember that in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 25, one of the main pictures of the consummation of all things, when heaven comes down to earth, when the Jerusalem comes down as a, as a groom, as a, as a bride adorned for her husband, right? The new Jerusalem, as it comes down and there's a new heaven and a new earth, this consummation of all things, the culmination of that is a feast, a wedding feast that Isaiah describes uh, a, a feast of, of fine bread made from the finest wheat, of fine wine, well-aged. Right? These are pictures of the kingdom when it comes in all of its fullness. So even in the Gospels, when we see Jesus having table fellowship with bread and with wine, these are pictures of kingdom feasting. So these, these are good gifts from God. Um, this, so th so we, we can conclude, I think, clearly that this was not written to disparage these good gifts from God. What this is, then, the second observation, is a polemic against excess, right? a lack of self-control. Hence the pair there in verse 20 and 21. Be not among drunkards, be not among gluttonous eaters of meat. These are people who do these things in excess. They take these good gifts from God and they abuse them, right? So um, there's an additional associate, though it's not mentioned by name, we clearly see it with the outcome. And that, and we often find this other associate with these two in Proverbs, and that is the idle person or the lazy person. One who is excessive in his desire for rest. I mean, there's another excess. So you can see how excessive drinking and eating go hand in hand with laziness. That's all you're giving your time to. You're not giving your time to anything else. or You're at a place where you can't even work. Eventually it will lead to poverty and to ruin is what we find there in verse 21. Right? So this isn't a polemic against food and drink itself. It's a polemic against excess. Right? When, we, when we think about it in those ways, uh, Christians will often draw two conclusions from, from this text right? and, and some other texts as well. So just want us to think about those conclusions and, um, and then think about how we navigate that because we're going to find that in the family of faith, uh, we have brothers and sisters uh, on, on um, both sides of this. Okay? Some Christians have concluded from, from this text and, and other texts that, that the way of wisdom is abstinence. Right? Total, total abstinence, uh, particularly from, from alcohol. The, the negative portrayal right here in, in 29 through 35, right? Uh, where... The, the one who tarries long over wine, he's the one that has wounds without cause. He's the one who has redness of eyes. He doesn't even know where it came from. There's a negative portrayal there. They'll appeal to other negative portrayals too. They'll, you can think uh, a couple of chapters over in Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, the words of King Lemuel where his mother is speaking to him. And, and, and she tells him... Uh, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Or we could go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, where um, it, it's, uh, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. I think the Christian Standard Version says, uh, Beer is a brawler. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Right? Being led astray by those things, you're not wise. Or 
you'll go back to Genesis chapter 9 after the flood and Noah comes out and he begins to grow grapes from the ground. He, he becomes a man of the soil. So he does bring a kind of rest. That toil that was mentioned, that was, that was laid out earlier in Genesis, in some way has been, has been taken back. Thorns and thistles are not being yielded, but fruit, grapes, right? And Noah becomes a man of the soil, and then he drinks in excess and becomes drunk. Bad things happen. Right? Genesis 19 sort of echoes of this with Lot and his daughters after they escape judgment. There's an escape of judgment and then there is uh, two daughters who are frantic wondering who will raise up offspring for us and they get their father drunk. Right? And, and you know the rest of that story. Uh, so really, really negative depictions. Uh, the, the, the difference... So, so, those who will ad advocate for abstinence as the way of wisdom will point to those negative examples of Scripture. They'll also talk about the differences between the strength of wine in biblical times and, say, the wine of modern times. Um, a, a, a wild yeast uh, that often was just sort of an incidental thing. Uh, and then cultivated yeast, even where it's introduced into the, the, the juice to, in, to accelerate the fermenting process, which means that the wine that is produced today is much more potent than it would have been in, in the Old Testament time or in Jesus' time, even though even in those passages that we looked at in other parts of the Bible, it's clear that that wine as well could intoxicate you. So that's, that's the second thing that they'll point to. The third thing that, that those who advocate the abstinence principle will point to is the potential for addiction, right? And, and the destruction to, to which that addiction leads, whether it's um, the, the rags and the poverty that we read in Proverbs chapter 23, or even broken families, right? And we, we all know those stories. We've, we've either been close to people who've experienced that, or we've at least heard stories about it. So, so the, the abstinence principle says if you don't ever start, if you don't even open the door so that uh, that alcohol can get, get a foot in that door, you, you won't have to worry about those negative consequences. You won't, you won't be addicted. Right? I, I can name some advocates of that abstinence principle. Uh, uh, three, three thinkers that, that come to mind right away, three pastors, John MacArthur, Mark Dever, and John Piper. Right? Um, though there is a difference among them, uh, Dever and Piper, it's, it's definitely more of a personal thing, a personal conviction. Uh, it's not part of their church policy. Uh, yet for John MacArthur, it is, it is a total abstinence principle, not just for himself, but it's, it's a policy as well. Right. Now, some, so so that's, that's the first conclusion, um, that the way of abstinence is the way of wisdom. Yet some Christians have concluded that moderation is the way of wisdom. And they'll point to those positive depictions in Scripture. Places like Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 26, when uh, there is some regulation laid out in God's law for how people will bring their, their produce to the Lord for offerings and for feasting before him. And if they can't make the journey, then they can take those things and, and turn them in for, for cash. <laughs> and, and then they can go to appointed places. And with that, with that money, they can purchase anything they want for their feasting before the Lord, including wine and strong drink. that They're listed in, De in Deuteronomy 14 as part of the elements of feasting before the Lord with joy. Right? Or there might be an appeal to a place like Numbers 28, 7, where it's not about the individual partaking per se, but that it was part of the drink offering to the Lord. Right, So it's, it's a part of an offering that he receives. Or you can go to Psalm 104, uh, verses 14 through 15. Psalm 104, verses 14 through 15. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, 
bread to strengthen man's heart. There, it's a very positive depiction. Or Solomon 1, 2 and other places in Solomon where we see this similar uh, appeal that your love is better than wine. Both are things to be celebrated, but love is even better, Solomon will say, and, and the beloved will say. You can go to Timothy and Titus where we have these character qualities laid down for elders and deacons where it says they aren't to be addicted to wine or they're not to be given to much wine. Right? Moderation, sobriety, self-control, which totally fits in with the character qualities that are presented in those places in, in Titus and in Timothy. And Timothy himself being encouraged by Paul to, to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake because of his frequent ailments. Now, that could also be because the water wasn't good. Right? But those are positive depictions uh, in Scripture. Um, so, so uh, we could think of some dear, um, some some teachers that that we that we probably love. Uh, they they probably actually become dear to us through their teaching. That would be more in in this line of thinking. Uh, deceased brothers like R.C. Sproul, um, or Alistair Begg, who's not deceased, and, and Don Carson, right? Um, so. That leaves us with the question, which is the way of wisdom? I think the answer actually is both. But let each one be settled in his own mind. Right? So let's think about moderation as wisdom. Um, inordinate appetites versus ordinate appetites. Um, consider the other partner in the passage that we just had in, in Proverbs 23. The the drunkard and the glutton, right? Um, consider that oft overlooked sin of gluttony. Right? The antithesis of gluttony is not starvation. Some people are indeed ruled by their stomach, as Paul will say of false teachers. And because of this, they go after strange doctrines and compromise the faith. Now, the answer isn't for the glutton to, to just stop eating. Right? If he never eats again, he's going to starve to death. Just as those uh, who are consumed with the love of money aren't called to just quit their jobs, take a vow of poverty, and retreat to the cloister. Right? The call is to repent of being ruled by your inordinate appetite or desire and to be renewed in the image of Christ. Think of Thomas Chalmers' Uh, uh, expulsive power of a new affection. The, the, the issue isn't uh, that you just need to totally stop eating or you need to totally stop making money. It just in those examples, the issue is you need to fall in love with Jesus, right? And when you fall in love with Jesus, those appetites come into conformity to holiness, right? So, so Paul calls it, with, particularly with money, godliness with contentment. But abstinence is also wisdom. <laughs> Think of the repeated calls in the New Testament to be sober-minded. If, if, if you want to read a really, really good article about this, um, it was Marshall Siegel. I can't even remember the title of it right now. But if you type in sobriety Marshall Siegel on the Desiring God website, you'll find an article that he wrote on, on sobriety that was excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, and maybe I'll even post that uh, in the notes when this is posted to YouTube. Um, but think of those repeated calls in the New Testament to, to be sober-minded. They bear some resemblance to the prohibitions in the Old Testament for priests and Levites. When they were on duty, they were not to drink before entering the temple to perform their service before the Lord. There was potential for impaired judgment. And in the presence of God, that was a really, really dangerous thing. It could result in certain death before the Lord. You can also think of the potential for bondage. right? The, those warnings in Proverbs, that's what they're designed for. right? They're designed to keep you from lingering long over wine. They're designed to keep you from... from being shackled and chained by the bondage of addiction to alcohol or addiction to food or addiction to just being comfortable and always living according to leisure, like the, the lazy man. 
the idle one. Um, some people know themselves well enough that their interaction with drink is much like the slogan for Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one. I can think of what John Piper says of himself. He says, I have an addictive personality. I don't even stop at one piece of gum. I wind up chewing the whole pack. Or you can think of family history, right? We're all predisposed to sin. We're by nature sinners, right? And that is made obvious by our propensity to actually sin. But it's also true that some of us are predisposed to certain kinds of sin. There are some who are predisposed to, say, alcoholism or some other addiction. So it would be the better part of wisdom not to even try the substance, right? So biblically speaking, then, I think it's safe for us to say that both of these positions are actually valid. For some believers, sobriety will be abstinence. For some believers, sobriety will be moderation. But the issue is sobriety. The issue is um, a moderated appetite for food, right? So, so how do we forge ahead? If this is true, if in the family of God, there are genuine believers in Jesus Christ who have these different views, how do we forge ahead? Well, I think Romans 14 and 15 helps us a lot. And I actually quoted from Romans 14 earlier when I said, let each one be settled in his own mind or let each one be convinced in his own mind. So let me just read a portion of Romans chapter 14. Just beginning in verse, verse 1 of Romans 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So, how do we forge ahead? Well, number one, we have here before us in Romans a tale of two believers. One uh, is partaking of certain things that are good. One is abstaining from certain things that are good. Yet both are walking in faithfulness before the Lord. So how do we forge ahead? Well, we, we don't despise one another and we don't judge one another. right? Um, as long as, as uh, one is not abstaining, <laughs> because he or, th he or she thinks it's a part of the gospel. In other words, um, abstinence is a work that saves me. We'll, we'll honor that decision to abstain. If, if the reason for abstinence is um, abstinence is a work that saves me and makes me right with God, then, then we actually need to uh, rehash the gospel with that brother or that sister. Um, 
So I'm not going to pass judgment on my brother who abstains. Just as another brother or sister who is able to give thanks for that glass of wine or whatever it might be that they enjoy with a meal, we're not going to judge them for that. Right? So, so we, we don't despise or we don't judge one another. We seek the good of one another as well. Um, we, we, we can think of a place like here in, in 1 Corinthians 8. We don't want to destroy someone else's faith. And this really is the essence of Christian liberty. I have the freedom to partake. I have the freedom to abstain in Christ. Think about that freedom to partake. Christ is Lord of my scripture-informed conscience. Right? I'm, I stand before him as my judge. I don't stand before him to be judged by other people in that way. I believe that what he has given me is a good gift, and I will glorify him by giving thanks to him and enjoying it, whether it be food, drink, wealth, work, whatever it might be. I, but I will take that stand with humility and not in a manner that flaunts knowledge that puffs up. Right? So that's, that's 1 Corinthians 8, right? So there is knowledge, but I might be using that knowledge, using that knowledge up. to prop myself up over another person. Right? I'll take my stand with humility and I will love at all times. Love always seeks the other's good. Love is always interested in the interests of others, just like Philippians 2. Right? So there, there's a freedom to partake, but there's also a freedom to abstain. Christ, again, is Lord of my scripture-informed conscience. So don't despise me. Don't judge me over that decision to abstain. When abstinence serves the faith of another, I will abstain for the sake of their conscience. And Paul speaks about people whose faith was being destroyed because another brother or another sister was seeing their liberty as a thing to flaunt before them and it caused them to be destroyed. We don't use our knowledge then as a way of talking an abstainer out of their commitment to abstain. The only, so the only time that we might think about that even remotely is if they're thinking that their abstinence is a work that saves them. They need to come to a true understanding of the gospel if that's the case. But otherwise, no, 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 no. I will not seek to talk them out of their abstinence. We don't flaunt our freedom. And we certainly don't see it as an entitlement. Right? If abstinence serves the good of my brother or my sister, I abstain. So how do we forge ahead? Well, we love one another. We see one another as justified in Jesus and before the Lord, his child. Right? And we live one another with patience, gentleness. We don't despise. We don't judge. We live at peace with one another, each one fully convinced in his own mind. And that is a, that is a recipe for unity and harmony before the Lord. Jesus did not seek his own interest, Paul will say, um, but he gave up his interest for the sake of others. Um, we who are strong, uh, Romans 15, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. So Christ became a servant. And we should be servants too. So whether you abstain or whether you don't, do it for the glory of God and in the service of others. Amen? Amen.